World Pneumonia Day and when Vijay Sekhan wrote to me, uh, I am sure I immediately had to say I will be very much here. Because this is I think an, an important issue for all of us now, once the diarrheal burden is getting a little lesser, I think the pneumonia burden is coming up in a big way. And I think we all are here to kind of get sensitized to an issue that's killing so many of our children. And as uh, Vijay Sekran said, every 15 seconds there is one child somewhere in the world dying. And I'm sure a large part of those deaths are occurring in our country. <clears throat> the question is that, is it the poverty that's making us? It's a large population that's making us. But much more than that, I think it's simply the uh, application of knowledge that we already possess is not getting implemented. And I think that does not cost anything. And that's why we are here to sensitize medical professionals, paramedical professionals, the community in general, that we don't need money to prevent deaths of pneumonia as much as we need a commitment and the messages to go across on how to prevent, how to diagnose early, how to treat properly, and in which case I'm sure we would also succeed. So what is lacking is not money. What's lacking is probably a commitment and dissemination of information. With this kind of a, a approach, let me give you an overview. I'm, I'm very happy that I heard the panel, which took almost care of every situation that we need to know. And I'm sure I'm going to mostly summarize and give a take home messages of what really this means uh, to all of us and what's our role in uh, commitment to a pneumonia control. Uh, I'm sure we all have heard this, that 19% uh, of global deaths in children under five years, excluding neonatal deaths, occur. And if you see in India, therefore, good 25% of deaths under five years are occurring due to pneumonia. And this was also, I think, shown in the panel that what is disturbing us is that the burden has remained the same with 60 to 70 percent contribution from just two organisms, an hemophilus flu and a streptococcus pneumonia. This was just came up two years ago. And I think that is disturbing. While, while we are advancing in many ways, uh, the pneumonia burden has remained just the same. And I think that's the time that we start introspecting and say, why, why is this happening? We have better institutes, we have better modalities of diagnosis, we have better drugs available to treat, we have vaccines which are coming up, but something is, I think, missing in the link and probably all those advances are not adequate to really get to where we want it. And I think that's one message that many times the scientific advances do not contribute to the betterment unless simple things are first implemented. And I think that's, that's where we know that we have been faulting and we all know this very well that probably the diarrhea is taking a second seat now as compared to a pneumonia and we all have heard this again and again. That's the reason why now we are forced to kind of celebrate such pneumonia days and so on. Uh, when we come to a term that was used by UNICEF some time ago to impress on people and the UNICEF coined the term a pneumonia, a forgotten killer. I started wondering that who has forgotten it as a killer. I don't think any one of us has forgotten that pneumonia is a killer. But what that term coined meant to us was that there have been many failures occurring and that's where I think we are forgetting. It's not that we have forgotten that pneumonia is a killer, but we have forgotten why it is a killer and we have forgotten how to prevent that killing by pneumonia. And I think we have a failure to diagnose pneumonia by caregiver. And it's quite surprising that this statement is true at all caregiver levels. It's true at the community level, it's true at the district level, it may be even true at the hierarchy institution level. So this is common to all. And to that extent, even in the cities like Chennai or Mumbai, I'm sure there has been a failure to diagnose pneumonia. So it's not only in some areas or it's not only for those who do not understand or for those who are not qualified or informed. I think everyone seems to be missing early diagnosis of pneumonia. And then of course there is an improper assessment of severity. We heard in the panel that it's not enough to say it's pneumonia. What's much more important is to consider how severe is pneumonia. Mild pneumonias might get better quickly, 
but the severe pneumonia is the one that is going to kill. And therefore, we have to have a, a proper assessment and then an ineffective referral to a care provider. We heard in the panel that every time you start an antibiotic and the next 48 hours there is no response or the child is deteriorating, this child needs a better care somewhere else and therefore a proper referral in time. Many times in the institutions, uh, the patients are referred almost at a far end of their probable life survival and therefore the institutions also fail to survive such patients. So there is a need for an early proper referral. And then of course, wherever there is a treatment easily available, whether you have a co-trimexazole or a marxacillin or chloramphenicol or whatever, I think there is a very uh, poor uptake of antibiotics for many reasons. Uh, I'm sure most of us, even as medical or paramedical professionals, may not complete a course of five or seven days of an antibiotic because we felt better after two or three days and we are very busy. Now, who is not busy? Now, those who understand the need for a full course of treatment also may not complete the treatment. Here are people who do not understand. They have many other uh, important course of life to sustain. And then the treatment of uh, pneumonia becomes only when it is dire necessary for a short time. And moment he is a little better, he stops treatment. It may be difficult for him to get to the treatment provider. It may be costly, the drug may not be available, and so on and so forth. And I think, therefore, uh, multifactorial genesis of pneumonia is important for us to understand. We are going beyond medicine. Pneumonia is caused by S. flu or a Streptococcus pneumonia is known to all of us. And what does pneumonia do is also known to all of us. But in a country like ours, there are multiple factors which ultimately cause pneumonia. And therefore, it's not H. flu or a Streptococcus, it's all over. But there must be something more in children happening for those who suffer from pneumonia and many others do not. And therefore, while the etiology exists, there is much more of a pathogenesis responsible with multiple factors. And I think lack of application of these factors and prevention of these factors, I think, is the cause of pneumonia and it's not only immunization. Immunization is just one tool. It's an effective tool, but then that's not enough. And if we ignore other factors, immunization alone may not work. We'll just quickly go through how is pneumonia diagnosed. I'm sure based on a very standard uh, symptoms and physical signs, which are developed to be implemented at all levels. You do not need a medical or a paramedical person to diagnose pneumonia which is very, very important. However, there would be some reasons to kind of improve upon those models, especially in uh, the issues where a medical or paramedical professionals are available. For example, a WHO guideline for suspected pneumonia, we all heard this, is cough with fast breathing or difficult breathing, and that's very fine. At least these are the screening methods. And one plea that I would make is that these are important even at the topmost institutions. We should start our thinking process by looking at the child who is coughing and breathing fast. But we may not stop at that, especially at the medical level, where we might end up with an excessive use of antibiotics. Every child who coughs and breathes faster or every child who has a difficulty in breathing may not deserve an antibiotic. But in a community level, it's safe to over-treat such patients, even if there is an excessive use, but in an institution or in a medical professional's office, that is not acceptable. And therefore, a rationality may have to be applied in relevance to the situation that we are. We do not want a, a pneumonia to die in a small village, even if an asthma is treated with co exercise. But we don't want to that happen in a teaching institute, and therefore, there is a possibility of doing something more. Are we contradicting the national and the WHO and government guidelines? The answer is no, because we do start with a cough and fast breathing, but then fine-tune subsequently to decide whether every child with cough and fast breathing deserves an antibiotic. Those who cannot differentiate that could as well give an antibiotic because survival is far more important than such rationality. And to that extent, I think rationality has a limit. And it cannot cross the limit endangering life. 
And I think what is rational at a village level may be irrational at the institute here. And I think we need to really take care of that. And I'm sure that radiographs are not accessible for the majority. And it is of doubtful value. We, once we have said that the diagnosis of pneumonia is reasonably clinical, I think an x-rays do not add on to Surely, in a severe complicated situation, there may be an empyema developing and whatnot, but that's not our major way to kind of prevent mortality. And I think, therefore, at an institution level, we may consider additional markers. For example, absence of past history of recurrent cough. Just now, Vijay Sekharan mentioned that if there is a past history of recurrent cough, atopy, etc., then it's likely that it's not pneumonia. And I think presence of fever, for example, many uh, asthmas are a febrile children. Though Valerie, the viral infection induced asthmas are very much febrile. To that extent, I think we can fine tune our diagnostic criteria in an institution over and above a cough and fast breathing. So clinical diagnosis of severe pneumonia, as was published some years ago, was a high fever, a respiratory distress, a bronchial breath sound with reduced air entry, and maybe a confident opacity on a chest section. The point is that we don't need to have all that necessarily, but we know that every cough and fast breathing is not an indication of a pneumonia and an antibiotic, and we start fine-tuning, though, again to re-emphasize, if one does not differentiate the two, it's fine to call everyone pneumonia, at least the lives are saved. And then, therefore, there are several hurdles in the management of pneumonia. Even when we diagnose pneumonia, it's not the end of all. And we know that recognizing sick child with danger symptoms of physical sign, we saw a video clip as well, and that was very, very clear, that if you have an inability to feed or sleep, irritability, lethargy, respiratory distress, chest in drawing, we saw all that on a video clip just now, and those are red flags, and certainly that is to be recognized, because this child is likely to die if appropriate measures are not available. And what is very, very sad is less than 50% of children are referred to appropriate craver, provider, and of which less than 20% receive proper antibiotics for various reasons, others are left to fight the disease without antibiotics. So, even if we improve our diagnostic ability across the country, that may not be all. This is what we are facing in reality, that not all children are referred, and of those who are referred, not all probably get the best of the treatment. Why is this happening? Largely because we do not follow standardized protocol. And I think those standardized protocols are worked out for the benefit of the majority. Small minority, you may have to kind of fine tune those protocols. And therefore, these guidelines are meant for others to follow blindly, unless you have a strong reason to deviate from those guidelines, which is likely, but to be done only by those who understand the reason for such deviation. And it cannot be that I think this will work better than that, is not the way we go by. And therefore, even if we follow by blindly the guidelines, we would be doing majority of the times the best possible management. And I think that is very, very important. Well, I did mention about the multifactorial genesis of pneumonia. <clears throat> Let's look at the common organisms, how it is transmitted, who is vulnerable, and what are cofactors. Well, germs are there all over. But it doesn't mean that all of us suffer. So there must be something in between that makes many of us not suffer and few unfortunately suffer. We know about the organisms, I won't dwell much on that. And we already said that large number of them come from these two and we have now vaccines for both of them. And uh, we heard Bala talk about the pneumococcal vaccine in a little more details because that's a controversial issue as of now because of cost-benefit ratio, etc. Though he did make a strong mention about the burden, about, and he simply put seven, eight uh, factors to decide whether a vaccine is worth or not, like a burden or like a severity, morbidity, mortality, sequelae, how early you can diagnose, how early you can treat well. How can you prevent it? Is the prevention very good? Is it safe? And finally, is it cost effective? I think a wonderful way of analyzing your own self in your own population, whether those six, seven points favor a use of a given. And that's what the IP immunization committee has said of one-to-one -one name basis discussion. Uh, it is not a discussion whether you can afford. It's a discussion exactly on the points that uh, Bala made. And I think that's where we, we go in terms of that. 
well, we all know how is pneumonia transmitted and can we stop this transmission by simple measures. Once an H1N1 came in, people started talking about simple measures of preventing transmission of respiratory infections and we know that some of the uh, organisms like in fact an H1N1 virus can stay everywhere you touch on your bench, on your desk and it can not only be there but it can be there sometimes for a few hours to even a day or two and that's the way it can go on transmitting and therefore I think if, if we know that yes majority are a droplet infection from a sufferer or a carrier it's not possible every time to isolate that sufferer or a carrier and a carrier is not even known and in that case I think we need to develop a clear simple message and I think I, I did see uh, how it was mentioned in a panel that you have a handkerchief, you don't sneeze, you don't cough, etc. And I think these are simple measures to take care of a transmissibility. So, even if you keep, take care of those simple measures and make the community realize that those simple measures mean so much of prevention of getting a disease, I think that's the prevention. When we talk about prevention, we talk about a vaccine. And when we talk about treatment, we talk about only antibiotic. And now we know that it's far beyond. And in fact, the need for a vaccine and a treatment would go down if we follow several multiple factors that ultimately cause it. We know who is vulnerable. And again, the panel discussed that malnourished child, lack of breastfeeding. I think it was emphasized a great deal how breastfeeding can not only prevent, and it's the best vaccine available for us, and there are enough reports to say that how a good breastfeeding exclusive for first six months and then up to a year and a half or two along with complementary feeding would take care of multiple infections, the respiratory, yes, GI, what not. And then of course we will be continuing to stay in a crowded area. If you are staying in this country, there is a crowd. So which area is not crowded? Immunocompromised children, malnutrition is the commonest immunocompromised state. And when you are talking about immunocompromised state, you certainly think about HIV and a congenital immune deficiency. Well, they are all rare. But the malnutrition is facing us a great deal as an immunocompromised state. And again, the prevention is an adequate breastfeeding and a complementary feed. And what complementary feed? The same family part. You don't have to have <coughs> an elaborate discussion on what weaning foods or what complementary food. It's simply what the family eats. And therefore, it's as simple a message uh, and that will prevent probably the immunocompromised state. Well, unfortunately, in the cities, uh, people have started uh, sending their children at school early and I'm sure in Chennai also, uh, they start sending in infancy. Uh, I know a child below six months goes with the mother. Uh, high time the mother has lost an ability to learn and a child has yet to develop an ability to learn. I don't know why they go to school and all they, they get is just the infection. And, and I think uh, we are in that state. I do not know how to change. I wonder whether IIP should take this strongly and say that nobody should go. I went to school after six, seven years. And that was the best time for six, seven years where there is no school, no study. Play as you like and do what you like. Never again that period came. And I think today everybody is in a hurry to go to school is a very unfortunate thing and I think the illnesses have increased. Uh, I do not know besides that the school burden etc. Imagine a, a junior KG child missing a school needs a certificate from a doctor uh, and I thought that if you miss a school you did something good uh, but you can't miss a school having got enrolled in the school so that's a pity but these are all multifactorial genesis some of them created by our enthusiasm to learn and I'm aware that we keep on learning till the end of our life because there's so much to learn and so little to understand and grasp but it's nice to know that those who have learned also haven't learned enough. So we are not far behind. And if you thought I know uh, better than you, it's 0.0001% may be better simply because of my grey hair that you respect and say that you sir know little better. But ultimately our ignorance is equal. So why hurry to go to the school and get pneumonia? Well, there are many co-factors and I think uh, immunosuppression, seasonal invasive pneumonia following a respiratory infection. I think there are many such reports and I don't think we should get carried away a great deal. I still do not find an asthma as a great uh, co-factor for developing pneumonia. Though I understand that any tissue injury makes uh, another infection or a disease come up easily. <coughs> but I, I still feel asthma does not need an antibiotic and I'm sure that 
these are the cofactors which are often talked of but may not be very, very relevant in our situation. And who doesn't get a recurrent viral respiratory infection? They all get away from it over four or five years of age. And I don't think that's alone. Yes, we are aware that a severe viral infection suppress immunity, local as well as general, and then promote whatever is around there. Sometimes you are carrying an organism and it flares up and therefore it is important. <coughs> and then I think uh, lack of application of preventive measures. And what are these preventive measures? <coughs> I think prevent infection and carriage by available vaccines and Bala talked about all this and I will not cover that except that I think what is important for us is not just a emphasis on use of vaccine but a better coverage. Look at the DPT uh, OPV coverage in the country. It stands at 50%. When the vaccines are cheap, when the vaccines are so effective, when the vaccines are known for decades, when the vaccines are freely available everywhere, even then, 50% take it. And I think unless 80 to 90% of the population take a vaccine, we will not find a benefit of that vaccine in terms of a community prevalence. And therefore, it's fine that we push on an H flu, a pneumococcal, etc. That's a beginning. But that's just the beginning of our big march towards the prevention and I think much before we will have the large population take a vaccine, we must ensure a wider coverage of a simple vaccine that have been available for decades. And I think that's a major crime. We do understand the need for bringing newer vaccine, but we also in that way not forget a need for a wider coverage. And I think if you give me a choice between a wider coverage and a newer vaccine, obviously a choice is a wider coverage and a not a new vaccine. So the new vaccine will take care of only few small population, which probably is less vulnerable than many others who are left to be far more vulnerable. And I think that's important. <coughs> but that's not all. I think we have a, to promote an ideal nutrition with optimum breastfeeding. And imagine to prevent a pneumonia, you talk of nutrition, looks something not consumer, but I think that is the crux of the problem. Today, if you want to prevent any infection, I think it's a measure of adequate nutrition and adequate nutrition not related to uh, affordability as much as we said, uh, a good feeding practices. And that was again emphasized in our panel a great deal. And we know that a timely weaning with a family farm and then, of course, secondary prevention is an early diagnosis because, unfortunately, all that primary prevention will not prevent occurrence of severe diseases. And Bala mentioned that our fight with the bacteria and the organisms, we will never succeed. But we will have to keep one pace ahead of them. And I think for that, we need to know also about the early diagnosis and prop treatment. So I think uh, I will just summarize to say that well, pneumonia is the most common cause of mortality in children under five years and has taken over even diarrhea and many other illnesses and unfortunately is not changed over here. And I think that's bugging us and that's where I think we all come here to see what is going wrong with so much of knowledge that it cannot be implemented even when it's not a question of money. It's a question of just the commitment and dissemination of information, getting rid of myths, etc. I think emphasis must change from early diagnosis and from treatment to preventive measures as they are much cost effective. I think there are many, many reports which have analyzed the cost benefit ratio of every modality of preventive measure and uh, the best that comes out is the breastfeeding. And I think exclusive breastfeeding and a proper weaning is probably the cheapest, most cost effective measure against many diseases and of course many um, uh, infections and pneumonia too. And as I mentioned again, a wider coverage of EPI vaccine. It's pity that even today uh, we have been almost last now uh, from 1995 the pulse polio program etc. We don't seem to get where we want to. And the questions now are debated whether it's possible at all. And I think IPV has come in but that may not be an answer to our success. And I think therefore our answer to success lies somewhere in the community application more than a great research that comes with science. While that is very important, it doesn't seem to be most important at present. And what is most important is available knowledge to reach to the community. And I think that's, that's where we probably have been failing. 
Well, we will have an introduction of an HIV. As was mentioned, it's already coming up in a face manner. The government of India has accepted it, which is good. But that is not all again. What about the coverage? And I think a pneumococcal vaccine may also come together, as was mentioned. Uh, Gavi has said it will fund in a very, very big way. And if it does happen, then I think it will be available. I still have my problems with such availability <coughs> because would it be available to all children in the country? Probably no. Would it be available with Gavi support to whom? To most vulnerable. And we have known that whatever is selectively available to the country goes where it is not required and doesn't go really where it should. So I wonder how a government of India will monitor a Gavi support of vaccines reaching the vulnerable and not reaching those who are not vulnerable. Well, those who are not vulnerable are often affordable. They can as well take the vaccine from the private market, whatever the cost. But those who are vulnerable are often non-affordable. And would the Gavi supported vaccine go only there? I do not know how we will monitor that. For all that you know, the influential people's grandchildren will take the vaccine and the vulnerability will not be considered and the burden of pneumonia will not come down in spite of support. I'm sure the government of India must be taking care of that. If a person like me can think, surely big people with many thought leaders could think as well. But the question again is, can they implement it? We have many good thoughts, but we don't know how to implement them successfully and therefore I'm happy that Gavi has kind of offered and I'm told that it will be even less than a dollar or maybe some 15 cents. Now, that will be great that the vaccine that costs in the market 4,000 or whatever will be available for just 15 rupees and that the government will pay that 15 rupees. The question is who will take that advantage and I have no answer to that and I strongly feel that unless the government prepares a formula to use such aided vaccine, I think our final aim of controlling the burden, and I'm sure uh, we will t ask the, your health minister who is coming now, I'm told, that he must give a thought to that. What can we do sitting here? And I suppose, therefore, I'll just end up by saying that it's time that we are aware pneumonia is the biggest killer. And we have so much of knowledge, but the fact remains that there is some missing link between a knowledge and a wisdom, as they say. Wisdom is applying knowledge where it's required. So the knowledge is just remembering some facts and being happy that I'm so knowledgeable. And I think that's where we, we most of us, I'm aware that many of us leave this world without getting wisdom. And I'm told the wisdom tooth often doesn't come. And even if it came to me, the wisdom did not follow. That's the myth of teething everywhere. Thank you very much, Dr. Parthar, to all of you.